I'm not just throwing a compliment here, uh, although I, I know I compliment a lot of artists, but uh, this new record is one of the best records of the year, and I've been saying that for the past few weeks since I've heard it. I can't not stop listening to it. It's so good. That's awesome to hear. I'm waiting for someone to tell me that. I, I've gotten some... <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I've heard the nice you know, props here and there, but I still can't tell if anyone really likes it or not. Or if they're just... Uh, you know, impressed that we made another record as that can, you know, be hard, big enough task as it is getting it done, but getting it done and knowing someone actually enjoys it, that means a lot. Thank you. I've just, uh, I have fell so far into it and, and just, you know, the rockers are great rockers and the, um, the slow songs just put me in this really, it's like a really warm trance, uh, if that, if that makes sense. Like, you know, the song with uh, Lost My Mind, um, God, I think I've had that on repeat yeah, over you'd, and over. You'd have, to, you'd have to lose your mind. Yeah, that's that's how I've been describing it to people. It is all kind of designed to, to remain in that in that trance kind of state, song to song, but uh, even as the whole record sort of unfolds to yeah, never kind of, never hitting me with anything too, uh, you know, jarring, I guess, but like keeping it all interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like, you know, I'm going to use the word drone in the old uh, John Cale sort of style because what was really impressive that I noticed the first time around is you you guys use a lot of drone qualities within the song, but without losing the groove. Like a lot of great, you know, songs that kind of fall into that, you know, are, are sort of interesting because of the trance, but every one of these songs still carries a groove to it. And I think that's impressive because that's not always easy, you know, when you're looking for stuff like that. Yeah. Did, I'm glad you referenced John Kale. Yeah, he was I actually really just started listening to him in like uh I don't know, I guess right before we started making that record and um nat- especially naturally. And yeah, that that thing would be the way you can deliver a song and like you almost don't notice that the song just went by. It's like, oh, uh I was just in a place there for a minute. Mississippi Fred McDowell is one of my favorite sort of players and, and you know blues Delta blues players is he I think that's why I love him so much he kind of just keeps you in a trance really it's you know as opposed to maybe like Robert Johnson or something mm-hmm. who kind of moves through the songs and you feel the changes like Fred McDowell just kind of get, gets on the train rides it out to the next station and that's that's kind of was our mo for this record so you know doing a little of the research I see if I've got it right anyway, the way you guys defined those first two records, uh, one looking back at Appalachian Folk and the second one with the Delta Blues and its connections with Africa, it, you know, with what we're talking about now, was that the sense of this? Did you guys go into this with sort of a plan or an idea or a want in in the way those two happened? Well, first I should I should probably clarify those are those, those are probably not our own words, although <laughs> I'd wondered they, that kind of makes uh, they, they kind of make sense. It makes sense to hear it now, but like there definitely was never a, a plan for for those records. But but looking back, they do sort of character they are characterized by that. Um, and this one was I, if I could. It's still a little early for me to kind of be able to have that perspective, but if I could say it was characterized by anything, it was really kind of where, well, we, we started the whole thing really by just improvising together for, you know, these long, like one week sessions deep in the woods and you just go there for a week, bring a bunch of food because there's nowhere to go, it was like 30 minutes by snowmobile to the nearest town. So we would stock up, go in there and play. And I, I think it's fair to say that the, Sort of overriding theme of this one is is really just ourselves and where we were at that time is because um, what came out of those improvs was a, a dreamier, more atmospheric, more trancey than uh, anything we tried to record before. It might have just been the result of slowing down, going out to this place, and and kind of basing the sound of the record off that more than whatever songs I was bringing to the table. I've seen pictures of a beautiful chalet on the lake. Is that that's where you guys recorded it or rehearsed it? That's where we we went uh, initially just to really just to sprawl. Although we were recording the whole time, it was really just to kind of orient ourselves or reorient ourselves with uh with you know our sound um you know individually and as a group because you can get kind of caught up in what you think 
your band is now after seven years and what you think it's supposed to be. And it was like, let's just go play and see what it feels like. So we didn't actually have any expectations of leaving there with like recordings, although several of them did. Uh, you would have to lose your mind. It's a pretty good example of it. We tried to do that one uh, again in the studio because there was a lot of bleeding that was sort of causing problems for, for trying to sing on it. Uh, a lot of little issues with that, but we could never quite capture the same kind of spookiness that, that we got out there at the lake. Queens of the Breakers, the majority of those bed tracks are from that. But yeah, initially it was really just a place to kind of go do some pre-production and, and, and writing and just almost band therapy. But yeah, like I said, some of the, some of the tracks were hard to, uh, hard to recreate. Yeah. How much a, uh, how much an environment can sometimes play a part in a song? Just, that mood it's kind of big time yeah i mean to set the stage it was like yeah the, i think you saw the picture it's like a giant windows in the plane really tall ceilings looking out over this lake you know every day wake up to take a little motorboat out with a fishing pole do some fishing scribble down some ideas come back do some playing and nobody around whatsoever although one one day we were uh playing in that in that big room looking out over like just essentially just wilderness and a uh, a little drone camera just flew right by the window and sat there for a minute i was like what the fuck? <laughs> that was the a creepy that was, that was it that was the only visitor i know it was really creepy i was like what where's this person what the, what are they what are they doing but, right. uh, yeah it, it it was a little weird and kind of creepy <laughs> what did they think they were going to find what were they hoping they were going to find you know it's <laughs> No, yeah, I mean, maybe they knew it was a studio. They wanted to see what people were up to. I like to think it was innocent, right? But, uh, <laughs> you know, I could have been, I could have been walking around there naked, right? I, you know, I did that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it looked. Uh, that sounds like heaven, anyway. Them. Yeah. Other, otherwise, it sounds like like heaven right there. Just uh, pretty. It really was, uh, and I would, I'd recommend it to any band too. Going, you know, who's about to figure, you know, figure out the next chapter. It was really healthy for us to just uh just go there and play like i, I put in a couple of the bottles really just not not having any songs just take just going at it like uh like you did the first time you played together and he, and coming off those first two records taking your break i know uh you know you you, you both of you became fathers as, as i've read and i know that sort of probably plays a big part in the coming back into music especially because I don't know when you when you have to or or choose to pull back from those crazy schedules that always happens early on in a band's life. Do you see now the shift in how music and writing fits into your life? Has it shifted for you? Yeah, I I just thought of something how the the musician's life, the kind of crazy schedules of running around town to town, ridiculous hours, does kind of set you up well for fatherhood. Actually, mm-hmm. like in those, <laughs> those early. Those early years of father where it's like, oh my God, I've, I've been awake for like, you know, 23 hours straight, like uh, disoriented, like just being able to sort of handle the disorientation of, of you know, sleep deprivation and, and time stretching. The, 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 the trickiest thing for me in those uh, years, because my son Eli was born right when sleeping operator uh, got mastered pretty much like within days of that record being put to bed, he popped out. And in those the next few years, you know, a lot of touring and when it came time to start writing or at least focusing on what music would be on the next record, it, it, I did feel a little empty handed maybe because, you know, yeah, you are focusing much less on yourself and your own, you know, whatever existential or ego driven things allow you to stay interested enough long enough in yourself to to write a song you know or depending on what you like to write about for me I, it was always a bit of a murky pool of memory and confusion and you know yeah a bit of existential crisis uh all that seems kind of trite once you have a, a two-year-old to look after so i had to kind of reorient myself figure out new scenes and new times and places to write because I, I couldn't write on my sofa at 2 a.m. anymore right. uh, to kind of find a, you know, a new schedule, a new structure. And that was that was a bit hard to to navigate. Um, but in the long run, I, I think it, it 
it got me probing into it's just kind of more personal history, I guess. Um, that was what suddenly became more interesting to me was my own kind of youth and the things that shaped me that I didn't wasn't even really quite aware of maybe at the time or mm. or since then until now. Yeah, that well, and I've written a lot of songs, a lot of songs about popsicles. <laughs> Well, it's, it's kind of interesting that you do that because it seems like you're, you've done a sort of an interesting trick here, uh, and, and I'm curious if it was on purpose. I would almost assume it was, but you know, when you take a song like, uh, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Campromat, Campromat uh, a Russian there, which, you know, damaging material, everything's going on, obviously, you know, with, with, with Trump and Russia, and, and you have a title like Ready for War. I mean, if you're writing personal and, and from your past, are you in a way tying that around with with what we're all seeing uh, is happening out there? Yeah, the, I mean, both of those on the surface would kind of uh, appear to be almost um, topical or journalistic uh, approaches to songwriting. But um, even those songs for me, uh, it's funny, Compromise was, was named before I had even written uh, a, a lyric for it. Andrew, we had the, we had the music and somewhat uh, dialed in, and Andrew just started naming it that. I think sen- sensing that there was something kind of charged about the music, almost in the way Shayla's music is instrumental, but you can feel there's, a, there's an activism um, in, in, in the sound, in the groove. And I don't know if it was because of that or if I just felt it too, I started writing uh, the lyrics that came out there. And, and of course, yeah, even under those conditions, yeah, the song still kind of felt for me like a, a, a pers- personally addressing like consumption, consumption in my own life, like the political implica- implications of, of our own consumption, um, you know. And I was thinking about it at the time, I was like, what? Am I writing a political song here? And then it started to seem like everything was kind of political, like even the, yeah, your decisions of what to eat, mm-hmm. on how to get, how to get your, you know, how you engage with media. And so I don't know. I I like to think of that one um, as having you know, and ready for war as having a one of those uh, macro micro. You know, you can zoom in close or you can zoom way out. I think that's what I loved about them when I first heard them, kind of wondering if that was the case. And I, I mean, there's so, there's so many things to dive into in this record. It, it's got so many interesting layers to it that I'm I'm certain that I haven't peeled back, you know, all the onion skins just yet. Uh, but I'm enjoying it, man. I really am. <laughs> that's so cool to hear, man. And thank you so yeah. much for the the talk. Thanks, Kyle. Great talking with you, man. Take all it right. easy. Take care. Bye.